And now without further ado, I'll pass things over to the speakers, starting with Kudzai, so they can introduce themselves and kick off the content. Thanks again for joining, and I hope you enjoy the session. Thank you, Erin, and thank everyone for joining us today. So my name is uh, Kudzai Mandi Teresa. I'm a developer advocate at HiveMQ. So I do all of the evangelism around smart manufacturing and uh, the unified namespace. Uh, joining me is uh, Simon and Owen. Uh, Simon, you want to start introducing yourself first? Sure. Thank, thank, thanks, Kutai. Yeah, uh, Simon Johnson. I'm um, a principal engineer here at HiveMQ. Um, I also represent HiveMQ on the Oasis um, MQTT Technical Committee, and I'm chairman of the, um, sorry, co-chairman co of the MQTT um, SN uh, subcommittee um, and editor of the uh, specifications. And over to Owen. Yeah. Hi. Thanks, Simon. Hi everyone, um, I'm Owen Compton, I'm Senior Product Manager here at HiveMQ and I'm principally looking after HiveMQ Edge. Awesome. So yeah, we'll uh, get started now uh, with our topic, eliminating data silos at the edge with MQTT. Okay, so let's just take a look at our agenda for the day. So we've already gone through some introductions. So next we're going to really talk about the um, OT, IT, data integration challenges. And then after that, we'll talk about why MQTT is best suited for really uh, providing that bridge between OT and IT. And then after that, we'll take you through a series of steps that you need to take to unlock your data uh, for IT integration. And then we've also got a demo for you. Owen is going to take us through how to use HiveMQ Edge to solve some of those OT, IT uh, data interoperability challenges. And then we'll open up for Q&A at the end of this session. Okay, so uh, first of all, for those of you who might not be familiar with HiveMQ, let's just quickly go through our uh, product offering. So HiveMQ really is a, 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 the company based out of Germany that provides an MQTT platform which includes a suite of products, which uh, some of them, uh, as you can see on the edge side of, of things, work with HiveMQ Edge, which is going to be uh, the subject of the uh, discussion today, uh, and also a demo that you're going to see at the end of this session. And we've also got HiveMQ Client, which are uh, primarily open source uh, packages, libraries that you could use to uh, implement MQTT. And then of course, we've got our uh, MQTT broker platform, which consists of uh, Data Hub, which is a policy engine. And we've also got some extension ecosystem that allows you to connect to some IT systems. And we've also got a control center and HiveMQ Edge also comes in different um, uh, deployment options, including a self-managed and a fully managed um, offering. And we, uh, basically have customers in uh, a variety of uh, industries, which includes connected cars, uh, manufacturing and industrial automation, transportation and logistics. And also uh, we've got a footprint in the connected assets and product space. Okay, so to really start the um, conversation for today, I think to, to kind of like really set the context, we need to start by looking at the what's been going on for the past uh, uh, two, two decades or so, generally in the, in the technology space. We have seen uh, a lot of companies uh, in the commercial sector, mostly really taking advantage of uh, the ability to capture data and really use it for a uh, competitive advantage and really building business models around the ability to, 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 to capture the data. And uh, examples we've seen companies like Amazon, Netflix, and all these big companies that have really used data as a, a competitive advantage. Unfortunately, in, ma in manufacturing, that hasn't been the case. This is why we see we've got a quote there that says the manufacturing industry is data rich and information poor. We've got massive um, amounts of data that is being generated by machines on the shop floor, but most of this data is not being captured at all. So manufacturing uh, uh, industry in general hasn't put to, in place some processes to capture value from this data and use it really to uh, uh, to optimize the the, the production uh, efficiency and also to build uh, business models around the ability to really uh, treat data as an arts asset. So all in all, machine data and process data is heavily underutilized in manufacturing and has been for uh, for uh, for a very long time. 
but things are really starting to change. So that's why we've seen a lot of companies starting really to look at how best they could uh, adopt this digital transformation that has already been adopted by uh, many uh, co companies outside of the industrial sector. And a lot of the factors that are really driving this decision to uh, to adopt digital transformation is mostly really uh, being around this um, idea of being able to uh, uh, become a data-driven company, which really makes you uh, optimize how best you could run your, your production processes and also optimize uh, your supply chain. And also a big part of it really is um, around uh, the, the, the competitive advantage. There's so many companies and there's so many uh, 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 industries that are now starting to adopt uh, data as an asset, and they're also starting to to uh, to um to adopt some uh, business models that make them uh, better suited to serve their customers in a way that is really customized for them. And these are all the factors that are really pushing a lot of companies to really want to adopt uh, digital transformation. And and uh, and the other uh, aspect of it really is the idea of um how how uh, how can you sustainably run a manufacturing op operation and how can you uh, make sure that you really comply with the regulatory uh, 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 regulations and things like that. So these are mostly uh, the big factors that are driving the uh, manufacturers to really want to uh, adopt di digital transformation. Now, for, for manufacturers to successfully uh, uh, adopt digital transformation, a key part of it really is the ability to which they could integrate OT and IT data. Because for you to really become a data-driven uh, organization, what is required is for all data across your enterprise to be uh, in a shared ecosystem. This really allows you to be able to build your business model around that. But currently that is not the case. We have got this segmentation where you've got some data that is predominantly in the OT space and data that is in the IT space. So the first big, um, uh, objective really uh, before you could really start to consider yourself or really go down the path of uh, becoming a data-driven organization is to really look at how best you could really merge these two ecosystems, OT data and IT data. Now, there are challenges uh, around how companies could really start uh, emerging OT and IT data. And I'm going to go uh, through a couple of uh, these challenges here to first set uh, the context. So what has happened uh, within manufacturers starting from as early as like the, the early 90s is there's been a development of, uh, of solutions uh, for solving problems that are like in contained environments. So we have had some, some systems, SCADA systems that have been built around really uh, uh, executing the production. And we've got some solutions that have been built around uh, managing the maintenance of the shop floor. And we've got some applications that have been built to address the quality, logistics, and management. So what that has done is that it has resulted in, 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 in silos of data. So you've got data that exists in different silos and all of this data doesn't uh, uh, exist in one unified uh, ecosystem. So you've got all these silos of data, which really makes it um, hard for you to integrate uh, data from the OT and, 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 and data that is in the IT ecosystem because of all these silos. So the first big challenge is how do you break down these silos and unify all of this data into a single ecosystem? And the big challenge with that is most of these applications that I mentioned here uh, are mostly uh, exposing their information through proprietary interfaces. So you've got some quality management systems that are implemented through proprietary uh, uh, interfaces. So that, that is the first hurdle that you need to go, to go through just to get that data out of one silo into, uh, in, into a, a unified ecosystem. And you've also got different protocols even just on the devices themselves. You've got devices that are implementing OPC UA, Modbus, and all these different protocols that you may be familiar with. So uh, the first step really to break those silos down is to make sure that you are able to convert these protocols into uh, a common um, protocol or a common data infrastructure that kind of like really levels the, the, the playing field for all the components that are involved within your ecosystem. So a big uh, 
again, challenge that is tied with that exercise of, of breaking down those silos is the cost that is really associated with establishing that connectivity between OT and IT. And this is primarily due to the fact that if you have got some PLCs that expose uh, data through, say, OPC UA Modbus or some application that have got like a proprietary SDK that you need to implement just to get data out, what that means is that you need to build custom connectors each time you need to get data out. So if you want to address a data use case, whether it is OEE or is energy efficiency, predictive analytics, what it means is that for each and every data source, you need to implement a specialized connector. And this requires uh, uh, professionals with this expertise of really dealing with this uh, type of data source. So if you're dealing with PLCs, you need to bring in some PLC integrators to set up these connectors for you. If you're dealing with MES, you've got specialized MES integrators that you need to bring in. So you've got all these different skill sets, all these different uh, connectors that need to be built just to get your data out. And that's just for one use case. And then the, you repeat the process. So this is a, a costly uh, exercise and it takes time. Sometimes it could take up to a month just to get data out of the PLC into uh, a, an ecosystem where it could easily be integrated into the IT. So that's really one huge um, prohib prohibition here that you need to get past. And uh, the idea with really unlocking this data and making it available on a common data infrastructure such as MQTT is so that you have got all this data ready and available for you to whenever you want to build a data use case instead of going through the whole exercise of getting this data out using some uh, special connectors. And also just to kind of like really uh, expand on that, again, you end up repeating all these data use cases. So you have gone through one exercise, an expensive and timely exercise uh, just to get data out for, for one use case. So if you need to address another use case six months or one year down the line, you need to go through that same exercise. So you find yourself repeating the same exercise of setting up connectivity infrastructure. And what that does is that you end up with this connectivity infrastructure that is complex. It's got this custom or proprietary SDKs that are connecting applications directly to devices. And really it creates this typed, tightly coupled ecosystem and it also results in uh, data silos, which is kind of like um, ironical because a lot of companies that go into digital transformation, uh, they say, okay, I just need to co connect this predictive analytics application so that I can be a data-driven company, but they connect directly to a certain device. And then that data is remains siloed within that application. So it's just uh, continuing the trend that has been done traditionally but now with more sophisticated tools. But the, the, the bottom line is that you still end up with these uh, data silos at the end of the day. So what you want to do again is to break this all apart and end up with a common data infrastructure that is not unique to one application that many different use cases could, could tap off of and then just continuously address all these uh, use cases. So just think of a situ situation whereby you set up your infrastructure, you get your data out of your um, PLCs or different uh, protocols, and then you convert it into a universally accessible protocol like MQTT. And now you have got all your data in a in a in a unified uh, way. And I will talk more about a unified namespace and how you could arrange that. But the point is that once you have your data in that uh, common format, there's no need to go through the stages of replicating the setup of your data infrastructure. You then just continuously innovate by tapping into the same data infrastructure with less friction. So that's really the most important thing why you need to break those data silos into uh, um, a common language of information exchange like MQTT. Can I just add, just just one, if you don't mind, because I can yes, ask on one of those points, and I think it was really interesting that, that you mentioned um, the cost of these these sort of legacy project, legacy connectivity projects, and um, the, the the cost can be huge, and and the capital costs initially to 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 run these these connectivity projects is huge, and, and as you say, there's there's a slight irony that the the investment goes into these connectivity projects, creating a, a point in time 
connectivity solution that is is no is not really fit for business in in a year's time and then then you'd actually find the the opex costs that are associated with maintaining those those legacy uh, connectivity projects over time just builds and builds because you're just layering onto old connectivity solutions and it just it just grows and it and it becomes actually un, unmanageable so that's why in it, it sort of uh choosing to to um optimize for um to for a, a common in, in, integration um piece uh, early on is 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 really advantageous um from from a, a cost point of view awesome thank you for the input so now but why why mqtt i guess that's the question right so why do we need to to transition from uh, ot protocols into mqtt and um, if 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 you have been following really the uh, the space as far as IoT uh, or, or OTIT connectivity is concerned, you would have seen that MQTT has really become the de facto uh, protocol, really as far as uh, uh, connecting OT and IT is concerned. Mainly because this is an under a language that is understood in the IT as much as it is understood in the OT. So it makes it easy really for you to bring all these two worlds into into one using MQTT. And more importantly, is this idea of an open architecture. So I spoke uh, about how most of these uh, data or, or information is exposed through proprietary interfaces, and it requires you to set up some uh, direct, connecti direct connectivity to it for you to address some use cases. And this really hinders the innovation. So think of it this way, you come up with an idea today and you want to be able to test a hypothesis that you don't even know whether it makes sense. You want to be able to test that within a matter of hours or days. You don't want to wait for eight months for you to be able to do that. So having an open architecture, a protocol that allows you to have an open architecture where you could really just plug things into your data infrastructure and then test your hypothesis and then be able to determine whether this is something that you need to invest more on or not. And then also uh, just the idea of this being edge driven whereby with MQTT information is being pushed from the clients into a common data infrastructure. So what that does is that it really allows you to create this uh, single source of truth where information is being uh, pushed from sources of origin at the edge into a central hub of information, the MQTT broker, where it is available as a, as a real-time snapshot, such that any application, regardless of whether it's in, it's in OT or IT, has access to that one common endpoint where you could interrogate and find out what is the current state of my entire enterprise? What are the current events and what are the current um, uh, production that is currently happening? So this is all through that unified interface as opposed to having to connect to say a thousand different servers just to get a sense of what the current snap snapshot is. So now you just need to connect to the broker and you get all of that information. And again, here, Applications don't necessarily need to reach down to the shop floor to ask for information as you do with your traditional protocols. So like uh, client server or request response. And then what also that does is that it really creates this, um, this ability to buffer information because whenever connectivity is lost, if it's, your information is being edge driven, it means that information can be buffered. And you, I don't know if you, you were going to demonstrate that. We also see with, with one of the um, features that um, Hive MK Edge uh, includes that ability to, to buffer information whenever that connectivity is lost and then pushed into, into that uh, cloud or central uh, repository of information when the connectivity is restored. So that feature of Edge Driven is also very important. And also the ability of being lightweight because once you connect many different applications and many different devices, you also want the information to be uh, lightweight for it to, to, to make sense. And scalability wise also, again, using an example of having like a thousand applications or servers that are interrogating one uh, PLC that has got thousands of data points, it's easy to imagine how that could really fall over just very quickly if you've got multiple uh, applications that are interrogating that one server. But if you decouple that and have the broker, which can scale horizontally, manage that connectivity, it really allows you to keep on adding different components without really worrying about how whether that will fall over and, 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 and have that kind of scale as far as, is, as that is concerned. And just the, the ability to, 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 to integrate simply, right? And basically the idea is that you, you're using the best-in-class tool. So again, going back to the issue that you are 
you, you want to become an innovative company with data. And what that means is that you want to be able to identify tools based on their capability, not based on whether this tool fits into this uh, vertical stack or not. So that ability, using MQTT allows you to choose the best in class tool. So you can just pick up a tool, as long as it plugs into MQTT, you plug it into a network, and then you're then able to consume that information from IT or from OT. Now, this is a, a general overview of what that uh, um, architecture looks like, uh, industrial architecture that is based off of MQTT. So as you can see, you've got your IT uh, devices and components on the left, and then you've got your IT systems uh, on the right. So your MQTT broker then sits in the middle there and acts as that central hub of information where all these different applications simply just need to plug into that one uh, uh, common endpoint and then they'll be able to get information across your entire enterprise. So your data is no longer locked in all these different uh, uh, domains or in, in those different devices and systems, but it is now available in that one common uh, uh, data infrastructure. And it's, 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 it's really important to, to understand the, 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 the power of really having that common data infrastructure because you, you end up sitting with data that is semantically understood. Again, we'll touch a bit on unified namespace later on, but you simple by plugging into an MQTT broker, you could navigate your data by knowing the, the structure of your organization, you could navigate and find the data that you need to address a data-driven use case without having to know where it is coming from, what OPC UA server or servers or Modbus are really giving you that data. You simply need to plug into your broker and then you discover all of this information. Now let's uh, uh, quickly go through the steps uh, that you'd go through setting up this kind of OT, IT data merger with uh, using uh, MQTT. So again, the very first step is the protocol conversion, that converting from one protocol into MQTT. So as you can see here on this uh, diagram, we've got Hive MQH, which is a, 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 an industrial connectivity uh, software uh, that HiveMQ provides, which allows you to connect to all these different protocols, including Modbus or PCUA, and also it's got a it's got an a, an HTTPS connector, and also you're able to build your custom uh, 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 connectors. So in the case where, say, you you've got some 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 device that you bought and you really can't get rid of it, or some machine that you bought and you can't really get rid of it, and it exposes using a custom uh, 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 interface you're then able to build a custom connector to connect into HiveMQ Edge. And then you use this gateway to convert from OPC UA into MQTT. And then what that looks like is that this information then lives into ideally a centralized uh, MQTT broker. So that could sit maybe at a site level uh, or level three. This is where you will see uh, this broker sitting. All of this information that is converted from uh, OPC UA Modbus is then consolidated into that one central hub of information where your IT systems are then able to just tap into that data and be able to address all these different use cases that you may need to address. But connecting to, uh, converting to, 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 to MQT is, 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 is the first step. It's the first step, but then you then need to define the structure of that information because once this information lands in the IT side of things, Mostly data scientists or say citizen developers that need to work with that data, they most in case in most cases don't don't have a picture of what a machine looks like. So you, you the first step is really kind of like put define the relationships of all your data points for, that are coming out of the machines and what are the characteristics. So as you can see here, I've got a simple data model for a machine where the, the certain properties or pieces of data have been grouped together to create that picture where you've got the ID of the machine, timestamp, and the properties that that machine has, the temperature, vibration, and output speed. So you have converted your data into MQTT. Now you then define those structures and relation, relationships within your data, which is uh, pretty easy once it's in MQTT because now you've got a common syntax. You could be using JSON. We are then able to, to group all of your data properties into one uh, object of interest. And then the next stage, once you've got your model, you also want to normalize your data. You also want to enhance your data integrity because you could have data that is coming 
out of many different systems that interpret information in a different way. So say, for example, some system is uh, giving you temperature in Fahrenheit and other system in, in degrees Celsius. And then you also want to normalize your vi vibration to uh, uh, mi millimeters per second. And you also want to normalize your speed to units per hour. And this is super critical when you're moving your data into IT because all these analytic systems, when they need to work on this data, they need to have this kind of normalized data. So at the end of the day, you're moving from your, 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 your various or, or disparate protocols into MQTT, into normalized data in, in MQTT. So now you've got normalized data available in one central repository of information, which is really um, a heaven for, 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 for advanced analytics systems and all the different systems that may need to consume this data. Could then, you might just just say say a couple of points here? Yes, I think this is really this is really interesting and and goes to sort of the province of of edge compute. Full stop. Really, that the, the the where this data is being generated, the best place to do the the hygiene and and the, some of the normalization activities are actually as closest to the sources of the information as possible. Um, and that really means that by the time the information passes into the enterprise or sort of up up through the Purdue model into the enterprise at the um, hierarchy, um, then you can you can ensure that 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 data is 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 cleansed and it has as much meaning um, and is it has got integrity at that point. Um, and if that cleansing can happen out on the edge, you're removing all kinds of mistakes that can be can be uh sort of happen downstream from there um and it's the the people and and the people the, the machines responsible for generating that data and, and management managing those machines are the best people to ensure that 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 data is more normalized and hygienic at, 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 at the edge so i think that's a, a really important point to make yeah absolutely so again uh in addition to really normalizing your data there's also data transformation. So again, the idea really with MQTT is, is this idea that you, you, you want to be able to utilize the power of a common uh, language of exchange just to create analytical data, data that is ready for consumption. So this really enables citizen developers not only just rely on just putting data, because what we see in, in most companies, they set up these connectors and then they just get all of the data and then they dump it into a data lake or some place where it really requires uh, a, a team of data scientists to make sense of the data before it can be used by anyone else. But the idea of really being able to transform the data into an analytical payload where even a, 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 an automation engineer at the shop floor who could subscribe to receive this information can understand it and can be able to display this information in a way that it, it, it is understood within that domain. And someone from the MES or someone from the information department, management department is still able to understand data in the same way. So this is a case where you might need to be able to transform data. Say you, are, you, are, you want to reflect what is the average output speed, right? Which might be useful for some consumer of data to understand data in this particular uh, manner. So this ability to transform data is also another key step really in moving from OT to IT uh, data integration. And these are some of the um, capabilities, as you will see later on, uh, when and Owen uh, gives you a demo, how you're able to transform data and really add some uh, context to it, and then be able to convert it into some data that is readily usable by any uh, application. And then uh, also additionally, just adding the date context to the data. So you might be really receiving data that has got no context. And again, this is super uh, critical because if you are really breaking down silos in the OT and then merging these two ecosystems, OT and IT into one, it 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 it's it's um it might not be really worth it if data is not contextual because still you don't really understand what data is coming from where. So you still need to go through all of that process of trying to understand data. So you've got your data in MQTT, but you still need to go that extra mile, making sure that you add context to your data. So for example, you might, if you're getting information from a machine, you might want to know what is the current activity when that data was received. So you can see here an example where you've got maintenance activity. There wasn't any maintenance activity going on. Are there any environmental anomalies? And then again, everything is reported. So you're sort of like, adding context to that payload, which really makes it easy for um, uh, data analytics or the IT systems to make sense of this data and then be able to convert it into 
useful information, which is really is the goal of this OTIT integration. Again, these are the capabilities, as you'll see or later on, that we tried as much as possible to back into Hive MQH to be able to really transform your, your data, normalize your data, and really uh, add some context to it. So again, uh, another feature here, I think uh, 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 Simon might have touched a bit on that. Once you've done all of that, you just really want to make sure that the quality of your data is, is you're able to check the quality of your data at the edge before it leaves, it leaves the edge. So this is where you say, for example, you've defined your, 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 your machine, you, you've defined the characteristics, as I explained earlier, but now you want to enforce that. You don't want any device just coming up with its own interpretation of what a machine needs to look like. So this is where you want to be able to, 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 to define a schema with, against which you can validate all of that information to make sure that downstream you end up with high quality data. And this is really super critical because it allows you to, it, re, it, it, it prevents uh, technical debt because if, if you, you don't have mechanism of checking for your quality, it means that your, your DevOps engineers or whoever is building your, your data ecosystem needs to implement a custom script that needs to go through this uh, payload and check to see if this is what high quality data. So being able to prevent that technical debt is uh, really, really super critical when you go through this um, OTIT data integration uh, exercise. And this also is a capability, as you can see an example here uh, with uh, uh, Data Hub, which is a feature also uh, that was recently uh, built into Hive MQ Edge. Okay, so uh, now you've done all this, you've gone through all these steps of normalizing your data and, and contextualizing your data, but now your data is sitting in the broker, you need to organize it in a way that it can be easily discovered. So you've got your data, you've got all your objects, now you need to create a semantic hierarchy to make it easy for all the participants of your network to discover all of this information and be able to execute all the data use cases that they need to. So this is kind of like really where this idea of the unified namespace comes in, where you're then able to, to, to create a semantic hierarchy and then start uh, plugging in all the different uh, uh, data points and all the different objects and all the different analytical data in the levels of hierarchy where it makes sense for that information to live. So for example, you see you've got an ERP system that is publishing the work order information into that topic, MQTT topic uh, hierarchy, where it makes sense for that information to live. So whoever is looking to find out what is the current order that is in production simply needs to connect to an MQTT broker and then navigate through that organization hierarchy and then be able to discover what is the current work order in production, what is the current operational equi equipment if effectiveness with which this particular area is operating in. And then again, you can see here where we've got a, a point-to-point -point protocol, which is your OPC and Modbus, and then you've got that edge that con converting that information and then plugging that data into this unified namespace. So OTIT data unification is kind of like really this last piece that you need to put in place to just enable that semantic discovery of your information, which really makes it easy for you to start to address your data use cases within hours of having set up this kind of infrastructure. So this is basically a reference architecture that kind of like really is meant to give you a, a picture or an idea of what that would look like. So for example, here we've got um, uh, your, your production, a shop floor, and you've got Hive MQ Edge, like, which, is, which is a connectivity software that embeds an MQTT broker. So ideally you would deploy that at the area or line level, and then it connects to all your different uh, uh, OPC UA and Modbus uh, devices and systems. And then it publishes this information to your site uh, uh, level broker where, where you've got also your, your site UNS. And then you've got in cases where you already say have a cap server installation, you could have cap server directly publishing to your site UNS, or you could have the cap server expose all of this information via OPC UA. And then your edge, Hive MQ Edge is then able to connect to the cap, cap server and then Get, grab this data using OPC UA. The advantage over here is that now you're moving your cap server data through a pipeline where it is able to be uh, arranged in a unified namespace. It is also able to be validated. It is able to be normalized. And then before it goes into uh, uh, the site level UNS. So again, the idea here is to try and push all this functionality right to the edge as possible before it moves to another level of your uh, MQTT infrastructure. So, 
this kind of like gives you a picture. In, in this case, you might have also an enterprise level MQTT broker where all of this information is moving from your Hive MQH to your Hive MQ enterprise or professional at site level and up to an enterprise wide where you can then have uh, integration with your enterprise uh, systems. Okay, so now I think it's time to hand uh, this over to, to Owen to talk about Hive MQH a bit in detail and show us a demo. Owen, over to you. Hey, thanks, Kudzai. I'm just going to uh, take over the screen. Okay. There we go. Yeah, so um, as Kudzai has alluded to in some of the in the slides there that uh, th this tool really is a gateway to help you bridge that OT and IT gap and bring a multiple array of different data types into that normalization around MQTT, um, particularly where a modern PLCs now can actually um, communicate in MQTT, but that's an expensive process to go through. Not many manufacturers or anyone working in industrial areas can afford the the operational expenditure to actually upgrade all those PLCs and and move it further into the future in terms of data normalization. So that's where this tool comes in really handy. So <clears throat> what we have here is an array of protocol adapters that uh, we are currently providing in Edge. Um, S7, OPCUA, uh, ADS, Modbus, um, HTTP connector, and Ethernet IP from Alan Bradley. Um, we're continuing to add more protocol adapters all the time, so keep an eye out for those. We, uh, we're categorizing them um, to make it easier to find them as the list gets bigger. Uh, I currently have a few active adapters in here for demonstration. Um, I'll come back to those uh, in a minute. I'm just going to move on to getting data from the edge now. So in order to do that, we use what we call a MQTT bridge. Um, I'm actually bridging to Hive MQ Cloud right now. So I've configured this bridge. Um, I've also applied what we call our offline buffering. So uh, we're actually persisting messages greater than QoS zero at the bridge here. So that in the event of a connection breakdown, we're actually doing that store and forward piece from the edge. And uh, just to show you, we have a flow of messages coming through here. But we'll get back to that a bit later on. So what we've actually done here for the demonstration is I've set up some um, sensors in an industrial style setting um, in order to sort of give you a, a decent picture of, of what you might be able to do at the edge here. Um, in our workspace, you can actually group uh, of co uh, connections together or adapter connections together and uh, even view uh, statistics as a group or individually. <clears throat> um, the thing, the great thing about the workspace as well is you can you can sort of manipulate it and play around with it how you wish in order to uh, actually suit your viewing needs. It's also a great way of actually identifying instantly if there's a problem at the edge, if a connection is not quite right, rather than managing all of that from what potentially could be a list of hundreds of adapters here, where you might not necessarily see the running status that quickly. Um, you can manage your adapters from here by stop, start, restarting them, etc. cetera. Um, and we also have an event log that will try and... Uh, Keep you up to date as well if need be and that event log is searchable by source as well as well as severity date time etc um so i won't bore you with the the minor details of the ui etc but yeah just uh from a demonstration point of view what i wanted to focus on was this uh, pressure line here that we've set up which is an opc ua connection um what we want to do with that is actually understand um, whether there is, uh, a, if the pressure is excessive coming from that sensor. 
So what we've done is we've actually put a data policy in place to look for that, uh, which is here. Again, our data hub policy designer is very similar to our workspace. So you get this um, sort of interactive modular approach where you can actually look at the workflow, manipulate the workflow to your needs. So what we've done here is we're taking this uh, pressure topic in by the topic filter. We've set up a schema here that's actually looking for a number between zero and 1.5. Um, anything above that we class as excessive pressure for the purposes of this demonstration. Um, and we're validating that policy um, as in all of the schema. So you can do parts of the schema, or in this case, we're using the entire schema that we've created here to do the validation on the data at the policy level. Um, on success, that means it's 0 to 1.5. What we're doing is we're just applying the uh, some information to the system log, which is the seal pressure is in bounds, and doing a additional user property to say that it's true because it's, uh, pressure is in bounds. Uh, in the event that it climbs above 1.5, we've set up a system log to say that it's out of bounds or excessive pressure. Set, similar with the user property as well. But we're also doing a, a redirect to an excessive topic, which is appended onto, uh, sorry, it's yeah, added to the end of the existing topic tree. Um, and just to sort of demonstrate that that's actually coming through, we'll go back to our cloud and um, you can see all these messages coming through, but we specifically want to look for that excessive uh, message and subscribe to it so that we can actually see when and how often we get an excessive pressure. And this is the bit where it doesn't do it right, just to embarrass me. There we go, there's one. So <clears throat> that use case here could be, you could have a specific uh, device on the factory floor subscribing to that particular topic so that you get a, a warning or alarm when the pressure's got excessive, or you might be sending it to a BI tool somewhere just so you can monitor how often that occurs for maintenance reasons, for example. So all of these messages are sort of lacking context as well. Now you can use Data Hub for context, of course. Um, we have additional tools in here around uh, JavaScript functions, as well as additional operational types that you can use to build a, a policy that will either do the forms of transformation or changing of context, et cetera. But um, in this case, all of these messages are lacking context as into where they're coming from. So we have another tool at the edge, which we call our unified namespace prefix. Um, I've already set one up prior to this demonstration, um, and uh, which is manufacturing in Munich, zone three, finishing area, and then line one. So we want to actually append all of the messages so that we can um, start to determine back at our cloud broker where these are coming through. Why is that not doing that? That's now misbehaving. No, it still doesn't want to play ball, does it? It's never happened to you, Simon, did it? It looks like you. <laughs> it looks like yes, yes. Can you can you subscribe to everything? Yeah, it was. Uh, so let's unsubscribe to that. No. It is not playing ball, is it? But there's a slight embarrassment. It seems the demo gods are not on your yeah, side. Yeah, the demo <laughs> gods are not with us today. Um, <laughs> let's try. There we go. It just needed a nudge. 
Right, wasn't so, the demo gods after all. <laughs> there we go. It so, was a user issue. <laughs> so we pre. So we're now bringing all of those messages through with that UNS prefix, and they're now leaving. They're leaving the edge with that context. So what I've demonstrated for you today is the fact that you can use uh, edge not just to connect a variety of different connectors um, and data types but we can also manipulate that data through Data Hub. Um, and then we can add some additional context for our uh, namespace tooling so that you understand which part of your operation that those messages are coming through from. So hopefully that's been informative and um, I will now hand over to Erin, I think, for Q&A, is it? Yes, I'm gonna let Kudzai jump in here for that. Oh yes. <clears throat> so, so uh, uh, Owen, can you speak? To, can can you speak about the uh, offerings that we have uh, for Edge? So, like the commercial and and open source. Yeah, certainly. Um, so, uh, what you've just dem what I've just demonstrated um, is uh, comes in two different flavors. Uh, we have a open source code base which will enable you to do your protocol adaption and your bridging, be able to use the workspace functionality and the UNS prefixing for nothing. Um, if you want to start using our more advanced functionality like the store and forward with offline buffering and our data hub, uh, that sits behind a commercial offering, uh, which will also come with a commercial support wraparound. Um, and we're looking to add more commercial features uh, going forward in the future. And it's just to just uh, just to add on to, to to what Owen said there. I think um, certainly from the open source side, I sort of encourage folks to to go and have a look at the, the GitHub repo. You can create your own um, build there, and you can um, even add your own. Pro there's, we've got tools to allow you to add your own protocol adapter implementation. So if you've got some weird and wacky ideas as to the type of connectivity you want that maybe we haven't got in our standard set of protocol adapters, although we are, are adding adding more of those um, by the week. But um, if you've got some quirky technology that you need to integrate with, then you can simply use our tool, generate boiler, boilerplate code, and, and just have to write sort of 30, 30, 40 lines of code and build your own uh, protocol adapter and drop it in, in into the plugin. Um, and um, it will just appear in your system, in your edge, edge um, system, and you can uh, create connections much like you saw Owen doing there. Awesome. Okay, so I guess we can move into the Q&A. We've got uh, so many questions here. And the good thing is we've got the Hive MQH expert with us here. So I've been trying to answer as many as I can. I've got I've got through twenty as as we've been talking. I've been trying to go as fast as I can. But wow. um, if if I don't if we don't get round to all of them, then then we'll try and um, uh, note them down and and uh, find a way of circulating the answers um, after the after the call. Okay, yeah. cool. So we've got one from uh, Nunzio. I hope I'm pronouncing your name okay. So uh, they're asking how many devices could be connected as opposed to Hive MQH. Um, so uh, we designed Edge for constrained environments um, and we have been testing it on hardware such as Raspberry Pi 4. Uh, and we comfortably got a thousand connections up and running on Raspberry Pi 4, 500. Um, uh, as, as, yeah, it was about a thousand connections. And had, um, yeah, with 500, uh, uh, come on, brain. Uh, I think it was 500 OPC UA and uh, 500 uh, Modbus. Um, I can't remember the throughput off the top of my head. So I'd have to go and find a document, but um, it was fair. It was uh, fairly substantial. Uh, obviously, that degrades slightly when you operate offline buffering or storm forward because um, you're slowing that down, throttling it slightly. But yeah, it was uh, approximately a thousand connections, no problem. And it may just be uh, worth also mentioning at the same time, and I, I assume we are talking about Hive and Q Edge uh, for that question, Nunzio, but um, 
Uh, it's also worth mentioning that um, if we're talking about our enterprise enterprise broker, um, typically which would would sit in in your enterprise somewhere on on prem, um, then we released a benchmark last year which we were super proud of, which is two hundred million um, concurrent connections to our to our enterprise broker, um, supporting a huge uh, magnitude of um, mess message throughput. Um, so I believe we're world beating um, uh, in terms of our scaling capability, um, and um, we'd encourage you to try it out awesome okay so there's a question from uh, uh, latency so they're asking how is this different from ignition hmm it's a good question okay so our philosophy when we when we uh came we were thinking about Hive MQ Edge. Was we were aware that there's a few other um, folks on doing similar sort of things on the market. Um, we wanted it to be um, a simple, simple tool uh, that you could use and go in using well understood metaphors um, on the on the web. Um, create these things really, really simply, um, and just be able to get up and running with connections to legacy devices within minutes. And we believe that's what we've achieved with Hive MQ Edge. And we, you can do that entirely free so you can go down to our github repository you can build the solution um, have all the protocol adapters at your disposal um all run it from from a docker container um and um bang you're up and running in in, in minutes um you've got no um vendor tie-in um you can go and build your architectures out how you wish we work better when we work with hive mq so if you're backhauling then um you know backhauling to a an on-prem uh, hive mq broker which ach achieves massive scale um is obviously a preferred solution and obviously we'd like to have commercial discussions with folks um if 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 they wish um but um yeah simplicity ease of use um extensibility you can build your own stuff and contribute it to to it all free of charge um and then if you have some slightly more um uh deeper requirements in terms of um availability and things like that then we can talk to you commercially about that stuff and the rest of our portfolio as well so hopefully that sort of answers your question cool um i've got uh one interesting one from caesar so they're asking about hive mq okay about uh in quotes hive mq edge supports offline buffering when connectivity drops and can be deployed with high availability principles what called if needed the platform allows receive the batch of data manual. This is reconnected, but this runs on the platform. The data should be recorded on the gateway, right? So I guess that's the question. It's asking if the data is recorded on the so, yeah. Gateway. So what 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 you typically what we sort of typically see is that the um the backhaul connection, what we call the backhaul connection, could drop. So internet connectivity um, from your um, factory floor drops for whatever reason. Um, security configuration changes, internet connectivity drops. So that backhaul connection piece from your gateway itself, from the software gateway itself, um, loses the ability to talk over, over the internet. So in, in Owen's uh, demo there, you could see he was using HiveMQ Cloud, which obviously um, you need to speak to the internet to get to um, if you haven't got a, a plant broker in place. Um, so in, in those circumstances the the gateway will intelligently um pick up on the fact that the backhaul piece has been dropped um and will start spooling those messages on the gateway itself um when the connectivity is um uh, is re-established it will seamlessly then start publishing those messages um back up into into the backhaul connection so you you don't lose a single one of those messages um that the the offline buffering mode will also um, sp optionally spool out to disk as well. Um, so if there was a disaster on the gateway itself, so if the gateway got unplugged or a, a power cut with no no backup, um, then um, those those disks would be there. And so when it came back online, um, the messages that hadn't been sent up that backhaul connection um, would be again in the same way. It would be spooled on onto that um, back into the enterprise. Hopefully that that answers the question. Awesome. So if any one of you is on the call and they want to expand on their questions, if it's not answered, please just um, let us know and then Aaron will be able to unmute you. So we've got Shabas who is asking, do you support open telemetry for end-to-end -end logging and monitoring? Hmm. Uh, we do support... Um... 
I'm just getting this right. I don't want to to, to misquote. Um, we 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 do support um, ob um observability. Um, we have metrics um and distributed tracing available. I, I as I understand it. Um, although the details of which we can go into. But yes, our approach was that we should be able to track um right the way from the from the edge um all the way into the in enterprise and give visibility and observability on each each part of that um of that process. Um, and we do that through um, distributed tracing or through um, observable metrics that are available via API, which is either available in your um, uh, HiveMQ broker or HiveMQ Edge itself, um, which also has its own API. Awesome. So um, there's another question here uh, from Trent. They're asking, does the Ethernet IP adapter support more devices other than Rockwell? Uh, that's a really good question. And obviously this person knows about um, EIP and its nuances. Um, so the, oh. I added Trent so he can talk. <laughs> I see, I see. Um, so um, in, in short, EIP is is obviously an an, abs, an an abstract protocol of which many ven vendors use, and then within EIP frames, um, you get sometimes protocol specific uh, vendor specific um, message types. At the moment, we've been testing um, with Rockwell, um, and um, we and and that's all working. If if people need support for other things, then we'd we'd encourage you to uh, to ping which devices you're you're using. Um, and the reality is, we just need to provision devices and test them and things like that, which is is as Folks know it's um, sometimes um, a bit of a challenge to, to provision all the different um, fragmented hardware that exists because um, there's so much of it. Um, so um, we do our best to to support new new and different variants of the of of, of hardware and firmware where, where where we can. Sounds good. Thanks, Simon. I did actually. Um, so I actually am an engineer for Omron, so okay. that's why I was asking. So um, I was looking for support for uh, either the older controllers or at least the newer controllers. Yeah, um, well, you, you know, very, you, you know very well then about the the level of com complexity and fragmentation here, right? So, um, happy to 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 work and and look at what you're you're working with and and seeing if we can get something up and running. Yeah, yeah. If you guys want to reach out, I'd love to see if I could uh, have a Omron specific implementation of the EIP drivers. Perfect. Sounds great. Thanks, Trent. Cool. And then I've got um. So Larkan is asking about door and forward capabilities. I think that's already been uh, answered. So yeah, uh, HiveMQH does have door and forward capabilities. So we've got, um, let's see. So so Florent, Florent, uh, I'm not sure I understand your question. If you're on the line here, yeah, please do uh, unmute yourself. So I think Florence is asking, I suppose that is the solution proposed a lot of lot of api to automate some action do you confirm that um yeah i, I can I, I think i understand the the question okay. here for um so um we we allow uh, so as, as you saw from owen's demo we have um a ux in place so every uh hive MQ edge instance that runs up um you can log into um, a control panel essentially via a web browser and configure this stuff but the reality is in um in immutable deployment scenarios and things um or um api based scenarios you you actually have external um software components that you want to uh, have do the interaction with with the gateway to set up and provision those connections um, because you may not want to do them via a, a drag and drop interface. Um, so in those instances, yes, we support both immutable uh, configuration for, for containerized deployments. Um, and by that, I mean, we have a con an XML based configuration file. So when Owen was uh, adding connections that you saw on the demo there, what was happening behind the covers was an XML file was being updated. Um, so um, you can then take that that XML uh, XML file configuration essentially that can make it an immutable deployment um, and deploy that in a container, or um, you can interact with the um, with the API which will update the same um, uh, XML configuration file. So you've got all 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 sort of scenarios covered there. We feel we've got UX, we've got API, immutable and mutable um, uh, configuration modes. Okay, I think we can take uh, one 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 more question. So you've got uh, James uh, who's asking, how do you ensure that integrating all the data through a single MQTT for all the departments does not bring a company to a standstill when there is a bug in the MQTT? 
I shall I take that one or does someone else want to take that one? I've got a rice smile on my face. Please do. Um, okay, well, um, where, where the bug won't be in won't be in our code. So um, Hive MQ is is massively trusted uh, in terms of the the broker. It's a massively trusted um, broker that's been around for many years and is trusted by some of the biggest companies in the world. Um, and we we uh, operate at huge scale, um, and we have no worries with that. We sitting as I do as on the MQTT technical committee, I'm very aware of all the nuances of that you have to comply with to be a standardized implementation. Um, we are one of the few vendors in the world that offer a fully compliant um, MQTT um, implementation. And it's probably worth noting with a rice smile, I know we're going over time, but I, it's worth saying um, the hyperscalers in the cloud, so the Googles, the uh, AWSs of this world do not uh, offer a fully compliant uh, version of MQTT. We do, um, and uh, we're super proud of it. Awesome. So like I said, there's so many questions to get to. So I think Aaron will, will help us follow up with the rest of you if we didn't get to, to your question. So thank you. Back to you, Aaron. Yes, definitely. And thank you all for your questions um, and uh, engagement with our polls today. We really appreciate having any and all of that feedback. Um, and thank you again to our speakers, Katsai, Owen, Simon, appreciate your time today. Um, for those of you who are asking about the recording, um, getting access to the deck, that will all be available um, in the next day or so on our website. You'll also receive a follow-up email with all of those links as well. Um, and otherwise, uh, contact our team for any other questions. And we hope to see you again at a future Hive MQ webinar. So thanks again for your time, and we hope to see you again soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.